When Israel was a child, I loved him. And out of Egypt, I called my son. But the more they were called, the more they went away from me. They sacrificed to the Baals and they burned incense to images. It was I who taught Ephraim to walk, taking them by the arms, but they did not realize it was I who healed them. I led them with cords of human kindness, with ties of love. To them I was like one who lifts a little child to the cheek, and I bent down to feed them. Well, we're starting a series today, a four-week series called Major Themes in the Minor Prophets. And the Minor Prophets are a fascinating part of the Bible that most people kind of avoid, and I don't think they should because there's so much there. I remember when I first became a Christian, those of you that know my story know that I grew up outside the Christian faith. Out, I wasn't in a Christian home. I didn't grow up around the Bible. I didn't know any Bible stories. I knew nothing about God. And I became a Christian, and someone handed me a Bible. And they said, you're a Christian now, and this is God's word, so you're supposed to know this. And they gave it to me and said, read it. And that was kind of my training. And so uh, I remember at 16 years old, reading through the Bible. And I came to a part of the Bible that I just felt at home at. It was a part that just made sense to me, and that's because of the way it communicates. Uh, there's every, all of us have different communication styles. And my style, and for some, some of you might be like this, but my style is, is kind of like this. Just say it. You know what I mean? <laughs> that's my communication. Just tell me. You don't have to flower it up. You don't have to give me 20 ways. Just, just tell me what you're thinking. That's kind of my style. And it's also not only my style of listening, but I just kind of say what I'm thinking, which worked out fine until I got married. Uh, and then for the last 32 years, I've been learning how to not just say whatever I'm thinking and how, how to say things the right way. But the minor prophets... <laughs> My wife's laughing. I'm learning still. After 32 years, I'm still learning. Yeah. That's a whole other sermon. But... Uh, uh, but the minor prophets are so amazing because the minor prophets are like that. They just say it. They say, listen, God loves you. Deal with it. You know? Or keep doing that and you head that direction. Judgment's going to come. It doesn't, doesn't flower it up. doesn't ease you into it. The minor prophets just, boom, they put it out there. And because of, the, because of that, they're, they're, there's 12 of them. All 12 combined are 66 chapters. In my Bible, this right here, I pay, I pay, this right here, that's the entire minor prophets. Just that. That's all. All 12 books right there. And the book, of, the book of Isaiah is 66 chapters long. That's a major prophet. 66 chapters. All 12 of the minor prophets together, 66 chapters. So they're brief. And, and I, I kind of call the minor prophets Bible reading for people, you know, you know the terms like ADD, ADHD. <laughs> they didn't invent these things when I, before, you know, that came after I was a, a little kid, but if, I, if they had those terms when I was a little kid, I would have been like ADD, HD, HD, HD kind of a thing. I was always wound up and going, but I love the minor prophets because you start reading them and then you're done. You know, like Ob Obadiah, one chapter, 22 verses, boom, finished. Book, the whole book of Jonah, whole book of Jonah, four chapters, and they're short chapters. You read the whole thing in like seven minutes, eight minutes. I love that. It, it just keep, you know, keeps you kind of focused. And so we're going to be spending four weeks looking at the minor prophets and, and hearing something amazing, that what God had to say through his prophets then is exactly what we need to hear today. It's very relevant. It's very contemporary. And some of you were around uh, when we did the story. A number of years back, we did the story. And when I preached the story and when our team preached the story, we did kind of an interesting way where we had three locations for preaching. Part of it was like the upper story from God's perspective, the lower story, the biblical times, and then our story. And I had three different places on the stage I preached. Well, I'm going to do the same thing, and we're going to do the same thing. Whoever preaches here in Monterey and Pacific Grove at the Glacier Shoreline on Monday night, all of our different preaching, we'll be preaching in three locations to kind of paint a picture of three different parts of what we're learning from the Minor Prophets. So this area here, we have this nice little table, and actually, this is, my, this is the first part of my sermon. I put it on a scroll. It's been kind of fun. I've been carrying scrolls around back and forth from the office and studying from scrolls, just kind of for fun. Uh, but uh, over here, when we're here teaching... We're going to be talking kind of the story of the prophet, the historical setting, just kind of here's the storyline, here's where it happened in the world and how it happened in the world and the timing, so you can kind of hear the story and get a framework for it. Then when we move over here to the middle of the stage area, we're going to really talk about kind of what are the big lessons, the major themes or major lessons from the minor prophets. 
And so we're going to dig into those kind of key lessons that each prophet, each of the four prophets we look at kind of are wanting to teach us. So this will sort of be the didactic learning teaching area. And over here, uh, when we get over here, we're really talking about uh, what, what would that prophet say if they could sit with you face to face and just kind of look at you and say, here's what I have to say to you. I mean, if, if Hosea, well, today we're looking at Hosea. If Hosea could sit with you for a half an hour and talk, what would, what would be the heartbeat of God that comes through Hosea? So like for Hosea, I've got four different lessons uh, that are really the heartbeat of Hosea for our lives. And I'll try to give you a sense of what that prophet would be speaking to our lives today. So, so we'll look at kind of the storyline and the historical setting. We'll look at the key lessons and then kind of how that connects with our lives today and how that comes into our world today. So I want to pray not just for today, but for the coming four weeks and that we would open our hearts to this amazing part of scripture that just kind of says it and puts it out there. And sometimes when God speaks to the prophets, it's like, wow, that's really encouraging. Sometimes it's like, whoa, that's pretty direct and blunt. But it's, it's bringing God's truth in a very clear manner. Let's pray that God speaks to us. Living God, we come before you today. And as we gather here in the family worship venue and as Shoreline gathers in many different locations through this weekend, our desire, oh God, is to hear your voice. Our desire is to see your face. Our desire is to see our lives changed and transformed by your truth. So speak to us through these minor prophets, these, these short, powerful books of the Bible. And Lord, speak to us today through the book of Hosea. Bring your word alive. Speak your truth to our hearts and transform our lives for the glory of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen. So Hosea is, is, a, is a powerful and fascinating story. And, and the book of Hosea is really one that... Um, that I think if we capture this story and let it get a hold of our hearts, God speaks all kinds of truths to us. And so before I jump into Hosea, just a few, a few words about the minor prophets just to give a framework for these. They're called minor because they're brief, but they're just as powerful as the major prophets. When we say minor, oh, it's a minor injury. We think it's a small thing. The only thing small about the minor prophets is their size, but they're just as powerful and have just as much to say to us as the major prophets. The only difference is that they're shorter, they're briefer. There's 12 minor prophets. There's 12 of them. And if, some, if you're ever like doing a Bible trivia class and they, somebody asks a question about how many people there were, so they're like, well, how many, uh, how many sons of Israel, you know, how, how many tribes of Israel? The answer is 12. How many minor prophets? The answer is 12. How many disciples? The answer is 12. It's, it's just a, it's a, if you're not sure, just always guess 12. Uh, but there's 12, there's 12 minor prophets. Uh, the 12 minor prophets contain 66 chapters combined. So they range from very small, like a little postcard, to kind of, kind of small, but they're all smaller, shorter books of the Bible. But their messages are powerfully relevant to Christians and to the world today. We need to hear the message of the minor prophets. If you want to get a sense of, of the, the history of the minor prophets, you can look up here on the screen, that center screen, which is back with us now. That's good, because we made this really cool graphic for you. Uh, Jake, our, our graphics guy, made this for us. But it gives you from 820 B.C. all the way to 400 B.C., because we haven't gotten to the cross. And it's kind of interesting when you think about human history. Human history is broken into two parts. The cross stands in the middle, and before that is B.C., before Christ. And after that is A.D., which actually is from a Latin term, which means the year of our Lord. So all of history has the cross in the middle before Christ and the year of, after Christ, the year of our Lord. Isn't that cool? All history with the cross in the middle of it. But this is now going towards zero and then into, our, into the kind of our current era, the uh, year of our Lord era. And you can see Hosea is kind of the middle 700s B.C., and all of these prophets are, are prophesying and teaching, and they're speaking to God's people and the nations around them, and we'll kind of look at what part of the world they were in uh, in just a moment. But I want to I think together first about uh, just the simple story of Hosea. I want you to kind of get the storyline of the book of Hosea. And you can, you can read it, and hopefully you'll read it. You read it last week, you'll read it this com coming week with our reading assignment. But the, the, the story of Hosea is a fascinating one because it begins with this guy, Hosea. He's a prophet of God. He's the, he's the local, he, he's in the northern kingdom. We're talking about the northern and the southern kingdom of, of Israel, of God's people. He lives in the northern kingdom. He's speaking to his own people. And, and Hosea is this godly man who's seeking God. He's a prophet of God, the local priest, the local pastor in town. And God speaks to him. And this is what God says to him. And, and, and I, want, I want to start with just this, this one uh, short verse to kind of set, get the setting for you. In Hosea chapter one, verse two. When the Lord God began to speak through Hosea, the Lord said to him, Go marry a promiscuous woman and have children with her. For like an adulterous wife, this land is guilty of unfaithfulness 
to the Lord. Staggering passage. Here's this town pastor, town prophet, Hosea, and God speaks and says, Hosea, here's my word to you. I want you to marry a woman who is promiscuous. There's different ways you can translate that word. What it probably means is a woman who actually works in the sex trade. And she was a prostitute. Either that, she was known as a prostitute or known as a woman who people could have their way with pretty easily. She was known for this. And God says to the prophet, to the town pastor, marry this woman. Her name is Gomer. So Hosea follows God's leading and he marries her. And they have three kids. First, they have a little boy. His name is Jezreel. God says, name him Jezreel, and that name means scatter or scattered. And it's a picture of how God's people, as they rebel and run from him and run from him, are going to end up scattered to the winds. So, so the little boy first is born, his Jezreel is scattered. Then they have a little girl, and God says, you name her Lo Ruhama. And the, word, the, the, the name Lo Ruhama means this, not loved. Who names their little girl not loved? But God says to Hosea, name her Lo Ruhama, not loved. Then a little bit later, they have a little boy. And God says, you name him Lo Ami. And Lo Ami means not my people. And God actually says, because you are not my people and I am not your God. So here's this prophet married to this promiscuous woman. They have these three children. Their, their kind of prophetic names mean scattered, not loved, and not my people. And then it gets worse. Gomer packs up and takes off. She slam dunks Hosea's heart and her family, boom, and walks out. And not, just, not only does she walk out, but every indication in the text is she goes back to what she did before. She becomes a prostitute again. She becomes this, this known, available woman. So now the local town pastor's wife is available at the local brothel for a few bucks anytime anybody wants her. This is Hosea's story. And then something even sort of more staggering happens. God speaks again to Hosea. And he says, Hosea, I want you to go and love Gomer again. You go seek after your wife. You go search after her. And he literally has to go and buy her back. He has to buy her out of her indentured bondage to this, probably to this, this sex ring. And he goes and he buys her back and he makes her his own and he loves her again. And you go, what's going on? What, what, this, this is God's prophet. This is a leader who loves God. And then, then when you read the book of Hosea, you find out what's going on. God says, Hosea, I am going to send you to my people. And I'm going to call you to, to tell them of my love and my searching and seeking love. God says, my people, my beloved, have turned against me. My own people who I loved, who I, who I would give anything for, have run away from me. And they found other lovers, idols and other nations that they've looked to and other things that entertain them. And he says, my people have left me and, and they've broken my heart. And God says, and I love my people and I'm still seeking them and I still want them back. Even though they've done all this stuff, I still love them and I want them back. And Hosea, the only way you can communicate to my people with my broken heart is to have your heart broken in a small way like mine's broken. You go, man, this small little book has some powerful lessons for us. And so I want to think for a moment about, uh, about Hosea and about the setting that he was in and where he lived and who, and who he's talking to. I want you to get a framework for this. So you're going to see a map uh, behind me here. And on this map, what I want you to notice is, and this is a map of kind of the, the, the biblical, the, most of the biblical stories and times Old and New Testament happen in this part of the world. So you've got the Mediterranean Sea here, all along here. You've got this piece of land, and this is, this is the Sea of Galilee. This is the Dead Sea down here. And all of this area here, all of this combined for 120 years was one kingdom, was one, this whole area is one nation of Israel, God's people, the 12 tribes. And for 120 years, they had three different kings and they were united, they were bound together and they had a civil war. And it split the nation north and south. Sound familiar at all? <laughs> they had a civil war and they split the nation north and south. And up here in the north, there were 10 tribes called the Northern Kingdom. And down here in the south, there were two tribes. When they were all together, Jerusalem was their center place. That was their capital. And that was the place of worship. That's where the temple was. That's where they came to worship. Now, here was the challenge. When they had the civil war, and when the entire nation, I mean, this is God's people, 12, these 12 families that were all related to each other, the 12 tribes of Israel were all related. They, these 10 tribes, 
they don't want to go down here to Jerusalem and worship because they're crossing the border into the enemy territory. So the king, the king of the northern kingdom, his name was Jeroboam, and the capital was here in Samaria, he decides, well, I've got to make places of worship for the people in the northern kingdom. So he makes this golden calf, this idol, which God forbid, totally forbid. He makes this golden calf in Samaria and he sets it up. Then he makes two more kind of smaller ones and puts them in Bethel and Dan, the two kind of ends of the kingdom. So that anyone in this part of the world here could, wouldn't have to go to Jerusalem to worship. They could worship in Samaria and they could worship in the north and south of the country. But he makes these golden idols and he says to the people after he makes these idols, behold, these are your gods or this is your God who took you out of Egypt. This is your God, this golden calf, this idol. And the hearts of the people begin to go after these idols and they begin to run from God. So Hosea is speaking to those, Hosea is from that area, from the north, he's speaking to people in the north, and he's bringing a message from the heart of God. So that's kind of the framework and the part of the world this is happening in. So just some things that when you meet Hosea. First, he was from the northern kingdom, Israel, and prophesied to the leaders and the people of his own kingdom, people who knew him. Sometimes a prophet from the south would prophesy to the north, and they would kind of cross over. This is, this is his own people, his own hometown area, and he's prophesying to people who knew him. Second, he ministered for about 38 years that he spoke and prophesied. And the last six kings of Israel, of that northern kingdom, the last six kings lasted for only 25 years combined. And they didn't have like service, terms of service. They would stay till somebody killed them until they died. And there was all kinds of reasons. But there was this turnover of king after king after king while Hosea is bringing this, this word of prophecy. His call was strange and unique. His call was strange and unique. And I say that because I don't want somebody who's looking to get married to go to the book of Hosea and say, this is going to be my guidebook. This is going to be my directional book for getting married. That's not what it's supposed to be, okay? Hosea was a unique situation where God called him for a unique message and ministry. And his life is a picture of the heart of God for sinful and rebellious people. The story of Hosea is a picture of God's heart because God is saying to Hosea, I want you to go to my people and let them know, listen closely, I still love them with all they've done, with all their rebellion, with all their heart. Just like you went and loved Gomer after all that betrayal and unfaithfulness, I still love my people. And so Hosea goes through all of this and he's able to go and bring this message uh, that is powerful and blunt and at times difficult because he's talking not just about the good side of it, if they'll repent, but he's talking about the judgment side if they don't. And so it's a very, it's a very powerful book of the Bible. But I, as I look at it, I really see sort of four overarching major lessons from this minor prophet. If you're a note taker, you'll find in your bulletin there's a place to write some of these lessons down and you can use that if you want to. But four kind of big major lessons that come through the heart of God and through the heart of Hosea. Here's lesson number one. God's heart can be broken by those he loves. Did you know that? That the heart of God can be broken by those he loves. And he loves his children. He loves us. Listen to Hosea 11, 1 through 4. If you have your Bibles, follow along. It was Hosea 11, 1 through 4. And just listen to the heart of God. When Israel, his people, his nation, when Israel was a child, I loved him. And out of Egypt, I called my son. That's the exodus. He brought them to freedom. Out of Egypt, I called my son. Now watch this. But the more they were called, the more they went away from me. They kept running away from God. They sacrificed to the Baals. This was this horrible cult fertility god who people sacrificed their children to. It was this, this gruesome, horrible cult, religious cult. And they sacrificed to the Baals. They burned incense to images, which God forbid. And God says, yet it was I who taught Ephraim to walk. And, and Ephraim is another name for Israel. He says, I taught my people to walk, taking them by the arms, just helping them along as they were learning to walk like a little toddler. But they did not realize it was I who healed them, God said. I led them with cords of human kindness, with ties of love. To them, I was like one who lifts a little child to the cheek. I bent down to feed them. Do you, do you see the heart of God? Do you hear the heart of God? Like a parent or a grandparent who says, I love my children. I, I provided for them, but they didn't know it was me. I protected them, but they, they thought it was someone else. I took them by their arms and I helped them to walk. I was there for them and now they've taken off and they've run off and they've abandoned me. But God's, God's heart is broken because he loves his children. He loves his people and that message needs to be hear, heard today. God's heart breaks when his children run from him because he loves us that much. Early on in my Christian faith, I, I, I discovered something in my own walk with God and my own walk with Jesus. 
that there were times when I realized that, that my choices and behavior could break the heart of God. There were times I would actually try to do the right thing, not because I wanted to, but because I didn't want to break the heart of God. Do you know what I'm talking about? There's times, I think there's times we don't, as a husband, it's like, well, there's right things to do, but I don't always want to do the right thing, but I'll do the right thing because I love my wife, I don't want to break her heart. Well, there's times with God where I may not feel like it, but I do the right thing because this God who loves me so much, who gave his only son for me, whose heart breaks over my brokenness. So there's times I think that we just say, God, I don't want to break your heart by running from you, by rebelling from you, by, by moving away from you. But God's heart can be broken by those he loves, and he loves you. Whether you know it or not, he loves you. And his heart breaks over his children when they wander from him, when he loves us so much. A second major lesson from the book of Hosea. And this language is very specific and intentional. God hates, and there are things that God hates. You need to know this. God hates when his children run and cling to idols. God hates idols. And he hates when we go to idols instead of to him. God hates when his children run and cling to idols, other powers, and other people instead of him. And he will bring judgment if we continue to run from him. This is one of the places where the minor prophets get blunt. And they say, if you keep running from God, if you will not accept his grace, if you turn your back and just run, 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 basically they say, then you're going to end up where you're going. And that's you're going nowhere. And you're going to end up in some distant land, broken and crumbling. And even though God loves you, here's the thing God doesn't do. He doesn't force us to love him back. Sometimes God allows us to make the wrong choices. That's not just in the Old Testament. In in Romans chapter 1, Three times, the Apostle Paul says, inspired by the Holy Spirit, God gave them over, gave them over, gave them over. The people were rebelling and being sinful, and it says, God said, okay, if that's what you're gonna do, you can do it. Okay, if that's what you're gonna do, you can do it. Okay, if that's what you're gonna, and and they cycled into this horrible, horrible place. And God loves us enough to keep calling us and wooing us and offering himself. But what God doesn't do is hog tie us and drag us home. He doesn't do that. He loves and he pursues. We have to choose to repent and come to him and turn towards him. Look with me at Hosea chapter eight, verses one through seven. Put the trumpet to your lips. That's a warning cry. An eagle is over the house of the Lord. That's a warning. That's eagle circling. It's a bird of prey seeing that something's gonna happen. They're gonna swoop in, right? Because the people have broken my covenant and rebelled against my law. Israel cries out. My people cry out to me. Our God, we acknowledge you. But Israel has rejected what is good. An enemy will pursue him. He says, you know, we say, oh, God, we acknowledge you, but it's just words. And you're not actually acknowledging God. Verse 4, they set up kings without my consent. They choose princes without my approval. With their silver and gold, they make idols for themselves to their own destruction. They're doing these very things that lead them into destruction. And then Samaria, that, that capital of the northern kingdom. Samaria, throw out your calf idol. Direct, right? And that was their center place of worship. And, and, and God says through Hosea, throw it away. God says, my anger burns against them, against these people that are forcing people to worship this idol instead of the true living God. How long will they be incapable of purity? They are from Israel, this calf, a metal worker has made it. It is not God. It will be broken in pieces, that calf of Samaria. They sow the wind and reap the whirlwind. God's saying, you're sowing the wind, you're reaping the world, and you're pursuing nothing, you're pursuing vanity, you're pursuing emptiness, and that's what you get. And God says, I don't want that for you. I love you, you're my children. Come home to me. So God keeps pursuing, but he says, but if you run and run and run, there's a point where I say, then, then take what it is you pursue. That's never good. And can you, can you hear something? God doesn't delight in that. It breaks his heart. But when we choose to rebel and run and run and run, sometimes we pay the cost for those things. Whether we've never received Jesus and we're just never turning towards God and we're running, 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 and God says then then that very way to heaven, that very way to the Father, you don't accept him, then you just have to take the judgment that comes because you won't take the way to heaven. Or if you're a Christian and you keep running away and away and away, there's times where God says, okay, I love you, but you're gonna live with your consequences. And God weeps for his children just like we would, more than we would, because God's a perfect father. So God doesn't want us pursuing those things and doesn't want us living that way. Lesson number three, major lesson from this small book of the Bible. God's patient love is shocking and relentless. God's patient love is staggering and shocking and relentless. It really is. 
When someone first gave me a Bible and I read the Old Testament, I started at the beginning. I started at Genesis, I read to, the, read to the end. So I, the first thing I read was the Old Testament. And it's funny, people will say to me, well, I don't know if I like the Old Testament because in the Old Testament, God's so judgmental and so harsh. And people, I don't like the Old Testament. And that actually says to me, they haven't read it enough or very closely. Because when I read the Old Testament, for the, I'm only 16, I have no Bible background, but I'm just reading through it. You know what struck me? Not that God was harsh. It struck me that he was so amazingly patient. I'm watching these people of Israel rebel and turn their back and, and basically mock God and he does everything for them and they just keep running away and, and I'm sitting there thinking man if I was God bam they'd be done with and remember I mentioned I, I, I'm, I, it's good I'm not God it's good you're not God right um, but, but what struck me in the Bible is that God just keeps loving and seeking and pursuing with this long suffering patience now, there's a point where we can run from his presence. If we don't believe in Jesus, we just run the other direction. There's times where we can run far enough from him, even as Christians, that we pay the consequence for what we do. And God says, I love you, but you're going you're gonna to have to deal with that one. You put yourself there. I mean, God, God is a good parent. He doesn't keep bailing us out all the time. Sometimes, by God's grace, he does bail us out. Praise the Lord. But sometimes we just keep being rebellious, 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 and then we get caught. We go, how could God let this happen? You go, no, this wasn't God who put you here. This was me who put me here. We just have to acknowledge that. And we run from him and then, and then but, but his patience is, is staggering. Listen to these words from Hosea 11, verses 8 to 11. Listen to the heart of God. How can I give you up, O oh my people, O oh Ephraim, my people? How can I hand you over, Israel? How can I treat you like Admah? How can I make you like Zeboim? These are two cities that were right near Sodom and Gomorrah when judgment came there. They were these cities in the plain area that were destroyed. He said, how can I let you be destroyed like that? I don't want that. My heart is changed within me. All my compassion is aroused. This is the heart of God. All my compassion is aroused. I will not carry out my fierce anger, nor will I devastate Ephraim again, for I am God and not man, the Holy One among you. I will not come against their cities. They will follow the Lord. He will roar like a lion. When he roars, his children will come trembling from the west. They will come from Egypt, trembling like sparrows, from Assyria, fluttering like doves. I will settle them in their homes, declares the Lord. This is a prophetic word pointing to the time when after these 10 tribes of the north end up being taken away as prisoners of war because of their rebellion. And then, then the southern kingdom's taken away as prisoners of war. There's a time where then God brings back what's called a faithful remnant. He brings people back to the land and he restores them and gives them hope. All those years of their rebellion, all their running away, God is just waiting to restore. He's just waiting for them to turn their hearts back to him. He's standing there with open arms, waiting until they were done rebelling and running the other direction and ready to come back to him and come back home again. I wonder sometimes, um, God's shocking, patient love, if we push it sometimes. Well, God will forgive me. I can keep doing it. It doesn't really matter. And we just keep running down the wrong road. Instead of just saying, what am I doing way out here in the badlands trying to satisfy myself with this stuff when the spring of living water is just waiting for me? But God is patient and his arms are open and his love is there. And then the fourth lesson I see from the book of Hosea. When we repent and come home, God delights to forgive his children. God delights to forgive. God is waiting to forgive when we come home. And when you read Hosea and the other minor prophets, they're so clear. If we will repent, if we will turn back to God, if we will bring our hearts back to him, he's just waiting to restore us. He longs to wrap his arms around us and say, my girl's home, my boy's home, I love you. He's waiting for that. But again, he doesn't lasso us and drag us home. He invites us to come back. He pursues us and he loves us. And he invites us to come back to himself. In Hosea 14, verses 1 through 3, we read this. Return, Israel, to the Lord your God. Your sins have been your downfall. You're running, you're sinning. They've been your downfall. Take words with you and return to the Lord. Come home, come home. Say to him, forgive all our sins and receive us graciously that we may offer the fruit of our lips. And then admit that you've been looking for the wrong things to be your savior and to be your strength. Assyria, these other nations, cannot save us. We will not mount war horses. We're not gonna, we're not gonna say, okay, listen, our horses and our army, that's gonna, that's gonna protect us. We will never again say our gods to what our own hands have made. No more idols. No more saying, oh, look, I made this thing. That's my God. No, no, the God who made us is the God, not the things that we make. And then I love this last line. For in you the fatherless find 
compassion. God, we find our compassion in you. And then in Hosea 14, verses 4 through 7, God is speaking. God says, I will heal their waywardness and love them freely. For my anger is turned away from them. I will be like the dew to Israel, that refreshment. He will blossom like a lily, like a cedar of Lebanon. He will send down root stability. His young shoots will grow. His splendor will be like an olive tree. His fragrance like the cedar of Lebanon. People will dwell again in his shade and they will flourish like the grain. They will blossom like the vine. Israel's fame will be like the wine of Lebanon. This picture of just hope and restoration and a new beginning and healing. And God says, that's what I want for you. If, if you've never come to Jesus, if you've never made a commitment to Jesus, and we have lots of people at Shoreline that are still trying to figure out the whole God thing and who Jesus is, and if you've never made that commitment, just know that God is standing right now with his arms open, saying, I left heaven, I came to this earth, Jesus, as Jesus Christ, God with you. I died on the cross, I paid the price, I offer you forgiveness. And he's standing, he says, just come home to me. Receive Jesus, come home to me. And, and he's ready. You say, well, what if he doesn't accept me when I try to come home? He always accepts anyone who comes with a true heart for him. The thief on the cross, last moment of life, cries out to Jesus. And Jesus says, today you'll be with me in paradise. He doesn't say clean up your act. There's no act to clean up at that point. He's dying. But he's waiting with open arms for us, for you, if you've never come to Jesus. If you know Jesus and you commit your life to him, but you're kind of running from him, then his arms are open to you. He's waiting, he's longing for that moment that we would turn to him and come home. And so so if you could sit, or if I could sit with Hosea, and Hosea could just say, you know, here's the heart of it all. I mean, here's the the message that uh, if you bring it all just kind of down to the very basics of life, if Hosea could sit with you and just look and say, let me tell you the heart of God. Here's the four things that I I think that it would distill things down to and would want to speak to our hearts. First is this. God's loving heart longs for you, so run to him. I think Hosea would say, listen, God's loving heart is longing for you. He's waiting for you. Don't walk. Don't jog. Run to God. And his arms are open. Come to the cross. Receive Jesus. Or come back to Jesus. Again, I don't think we can lose our salvation, but I think sometimes we act like we aren't saved. We, we run from God. We do make bad choices. We, we play on the, you know, the borderlands of faith and wander out there, and God just says, come home, come home, come home. God's loving heart is waiting for you. And I think Jose would say, understand the depth of God's love for you. His arms are open. His heart is waiting. A second thing I think Jose would say to us is this, and this is what the, the, the book of Hosea shouts this message. God is shockingly patient don't take advantage of it. Don't take advantage of it. God is, is unthinkably, unbelievably patient with us. Let's not abuse that. Well, I'll ask God to forgive me in six months or a year. I'll, I'm going to keep playing and, and, and living the way. I, I mean, I, I know what's right. I know what God's word says. I know what I should be doing, but I'm just going to keep delaying because, you know, God's patient. And the thing is, he is patient. And he doesn't stop loving you but God wants the best for you. And there's not one person here, not one of us, that can't identify areas of our life, even as followers of Jesus, where we we aren't aligned with what we know God wants. I mean, we know what God wants in our attitude, in our actions, our behavior, our motives, whatever it is. We know what God wants. And we're gonna get to that. We're gonna deal with it. Right? Yeah, sure I am. Yeah, one of these days. But how about today? How about coming before God today and saying, God, I know in this area of my life, I'm not lining up with what you want, and I love you and you love me. I want to give myself to you in a new devoted way. I think Hosea would say, draw near to God and deal with that today. Address it now. Number three, and it's a tough one. God allows people to run from his grace and fall under his judgment, and you do not want to do that. You do not want to do that. Because God gives us free will and allows us to make decisions, he doesn't force us to love him. And God allows us to run and run and run until, and if we run off a cliff, he says, okay, the, the, the judgment's on you. you. You've done that. It breaks God's heart. He never delights in that, but he allows that. So just, just don't run down that road. If you don't know Jesus, man, open your heart to him. Turn your heart towards him. Come and talk with any shoreline pastor, anytime. 
and we'll talk to you about Jesus. If you say, I want to know this Jesus, I want to begin a new life in him. And if you're a believer, but you're kind of wandering, man, run home, run home, run home. And then number four, I love this. This is the heart of Hosea, it's the heart of God. God is ready to love, restore, and give you a new beginning. God loves new beginnings. God is a God of new beginnings. The one who spoke and all things came to existence can speak and give you a new beginning today. And he's waiting to. When you turn back to him, or when you turn to him for the first time, God says, I make all things new. And there's nothing in your life that you've messed up that he can't fix. There's nothing you've burned down that he can't rebuild. There's nothing you've kind of confused and played with that he can't put, put the pieces back together again. God makes all things new. And Hosea speaks that message with clarity. As we pray right now, I want to invite you to talk to God about your life. The greatness of his love is there. His arms are open. When we get far from God, it's not that God walked away. Never. It's that we've run the other direction. We have to stop and turn around and start running back to the one who loves us. Let's pray together. Lord Jesus, thank you that you love us and you pursue us. Jesus, you left the glory of heaven and you came to this world to die on a cross to give your life for us. Heavenly Father, thank you that your patience is staggeringly beautiful and that you are long-suffering with us when we rebel and fight against you, even when we know you by faith, but we keep making choices day after day and week after week and month after month and year after year that we know are wrong. And you're still patient with us, but oh God, help us not take your patience as approval. Help us not take your patience as an excuse to live the wrong way. Let us run to you and repent where we should. So just take a moment. And if you've never come to Jesus, just say to him, say, Jesus, if you would love me, if you would wash me clean, if you would give me a new beginning through your death on the cross, I want to know you. And just begin to tell him, I want to know you, Jesus, and, and talk with one of our pastors before you leave here today or this week, call us. We'll take time to talk with you and, and share with you what it means to be a follower of Jesus. And if you're a Christian, but you're just honest and say, right now there's areas in my life where I'm kind of running from God. I know it's not what he has in mind for me, I'm, but I'm doing it. And I'm relying on his patience and his love, but I don't want to live that way anymore. I want to run back into his arms and be back close to him again. If that's you, just tell him that. Say, God, I want to run back to you. I want to feel your arms wrap around me. I don't want to trust in myself or other people or other gods, false gods and idols. I just want to trust in you. As you pray that to him, and as he hears your voice, he's going to draw near to you. And he's going to remind you of your, his grace. He's going to bring you back into his arms. Lord Jesus, thank you that you love us even when we're unlovely, that you pursue us when we run off and do our own thing. You never give up on us. And God, it's hard to realize that if we run and run and run, we can live with our own consequences. But God, you do all you can to call us home. Let us hear your voice and respond and come back to you, running to your arms and running to your grace. We thank you that Shoreline is a place where we can come and be in the midst of those struggles and challenges of life. We don't have to be perfect here, but we want to be pursuing you and learning more about you. So lead and guide us, O Jesus. We pray this in your name and for your glory. Amen.